Welcome to today's webinar, Creativity and the Brain. I'm your host, Janet Parker Evans, and I am so excited for this topic. I am a creative by birth and by trade, and this is exciting for me. So, you know, research shows us that as the brain ages, it changes in ways that make us more focused, more flexible, and more uninhibited, and thus more creative. So it's no wonder that our Brookdale residents express themselves through writing, painting, drawing, filmmaking, music, culinary arts, so much more. This year, we're spotlighting that creativity through a new video series, Great Create, which pairs younger artists and influencers with older mentors to see what kind of inspiration strikes when the two come together. Today, we have the chance to speak with some of the people featured on Great Create. This webinar will feature one of our creative residents and two of the younger artists who were mentored in the program. So before we introduce you to our speakers, let's take a minute to talk about how you can interact with us during the webinar. So if you're joining us on Zoom, there's one way to do it, but we're also simulcasting with Facebook Live, so you might be joining us there. So for those on Zoom, things can be a little bit different from one computer to the next, but if you look at the bottom of the Zoom screen where you're seeing this webinar, you'll see some icons. The one on the far left is usually a microphone. Now we've muted it so that there's no background sound, but let me explain how you can ask us questions or ask for technical help. And with the other buttons, the most important are the ones that say Q&A and the one that says chat. When you click the Q&A button, a window will, will appear where you can type any questions you have for a Q&A session we're gonna have at the end. So feel free to start asking questions anytime during the presentation. And at the end, we're going to get to as many as we can. And you can address them directly to somebody or to the whole panel, doesn't matter. And the chat button opens a window where you can chat with the presenters and our moderator. And if you're having any technical difficulties or issues, please let us know in the chat and our moderator will help you if they can. After the webinar, you're going to get a follow-up email with all of this information plus a recording so you can refer to this later or share it with your friends and loved ones. And if you're on Facebook, even easier, just type your questions in the comments and our crew will see them and add them to our Q&A at the end. Ready to go? All right, let's jump in and meet our speakers, social influencers, Terika Witzel and Steen Aliyah, along with our Brookdale resident, Mary Nell Henry. Welcome everybody. Welcome. So to start this off, let's take a few minutes to learn more about each of you, right? So Stina Aliyah is a self-taught oil painter. And Stina, you have an interesting origin story as an artist. Can you tell us how you got your start? Yes. So I definitely don't have the traditional introduction to art or creating art where most people would think that I was introduced to it early at an early age. I actually discovered it later on, well, not even discovered my talent later on, just discovered my love for art later on after suffering a track and field injury that took me out for the season. Um, I was a really focused athlete. And so that was kind of the path that I was on was to just, you know, go to college on a full scholarship. And so the, the year that I broke my leg was recruiting year. So I was really depressed. I couldn't go to class. And so my principal counselor and my parents decided, well, the biggest room with the biggest door opening was the art room. And so I got my first taste of creating something out of nothing um, because of that injury. And I wasn't good at all. I was actually really bad. I just could not shake that feeling of creating. And mm -hmm. um, I was using like recycled materials and just trying to make like weave baskets and things like that. But I was healing mentally and emotionally while healing physically and that connection to art just I couldn't let it go after that so as the years went on um, I tried different mediums and about six years ago I saw an oil painter of a former classmate and I decided I could do it too and that's when I started teaching myself how to paint and I just I've never looked back since then that's amazing <laughs> Having seen your work, it's amazing that you started later. That's like such a great talent. Thank you. So next up, Mary Nell Henry. Mary Nell lives in our Brookdale Club Hill community in Garland, Texas. So Mary, how long have you been a visual artist? How long have you been a visual artist? Oh, over 50 years. 
<laughs> I, I've painted over 50 years. Yes. That's a long time. And you, and you paint, do you, do you, are you a oil painter or any medium or? Uh, I use just about any medium. I started with oils and moved into acrylics when I moved here in Dallas years ago. And then uh, took up uh, watercolors uh, after I retired. And uh, I do just about anything now. That's great. Next up is Terika Witzel, whose artfully decorated cakes are a smash on Instagram. Mm -hmm. Culinary arts are also one of my favorites. So, Terika, how long have you been pursuing your love of baking, and how'd you get started? Well, I've only been decorating cakes for a few years. I mean, I started in about 2017 at some some point, and um, and it really all started. I mean, I in my trade of graphic design, I've, I've worked in corporate environments where I'm I'm creative all the time. That's just what I do. Um, and so, where I was at the time. Um, I was working for a company that had a lot of opportunity to celebrate their employees, whether that was celebrating for their birthdays, they would have parties and things like that. And it was super fun. The morale was great. Um, and then I had switched jobs. And when I switched, I made the switch, it didn't do things like that. Um, they, needed, they needed a little boost, let's just say that. <laughs> They needed a boost to morale. So I had always been very creative my whole entire life, whether that was, you know, wood shop or uh, ceramics and painting and things like that. I always dabbled in it. And I thought I could be, you know, I could be okay at decorating cakes. So at this job, I said, you know what? I'm going to start making cakes for people on their birthdays to bring up that morale. And so that was a chance for me to just kind of like get creative in a different way. Um, and so I started doing that and I wasn't good. <laughs> I wasn't great at it. I had no idea what I was doing, um, but they turned out all right. And my proud mother-in-law um, shared that I was making cakes with her coworker and, and her coworker happened to say, you know what, could she make my daughter's baby shower cake? And she's like, yeah, she could do it. She could do it. So she presents this thing to me, this idea. And it's this huge, I mean, three tier completely covered in fondant zoo animal type cake. And I looked at it and I was like, um, I can try. So I did it and um, I record the entire thing and it actually didn't turn out half bad. Um, it didn't turn out half bad. And clearly because since then I have just been swarmed with requests for cakes. And so that's kind of how it all started. And like Stina, I haven't, you know, I haven't turned, turned away from it. So it's been, it's been fun. That's awesome. That's right. Yeah, that freedom to fail and that lack of fear around failing, like that's creativity, right? You just have to keep going at it. So that's awesome. So, hey, Mary, let's talk a bit about this idea that aging has an effect on the brain that can enhance creativity. And yeah, and older adults may be less inhibited than when they were younger, less susceptible to self-doubt, more confident in themselves. And I read an article the other day that divergent thinking in the brain peaks in your 20s and then again, even higher in your 70s, which I thought was interesting. I thought it was very interesting. So did you notice that your approach to your art changed in any way as you got older? Uh, it probably gave me different thought patterns because as you get older, your responsibilities fall off some, so you don't have the responsibilities. Uh, like when I, since I've been here, uh, one thing I was thinking about, uh, Janet, was the fact that uh, it also, your art brings back memories. So every time you paint something or start sketch something that makes you want to remember. So it's also in, in good uh, memory, makes you think uh, back, uh, helps you with your memory. Yeah, I can absolutely see that. Like oh, you're drawing on so much of your uh -huh. life. You're doing that. Yes. Yes, and I'm painting all the time here. I just got through working with a group, in fact, and I was very, very split. Uh, David keeps us real busy with uh, with art, and uh, the, some of these ladies are just get excited when they when I tell them that they can draw leaves or that yeah. they can draw flowers, and that's fun for me too. It makes me feel good that they feel good. That's great. Do you think that like ideas? for what to do come more easily to you now? Do you think you're more focused now that you're older than you did when you were younger? 
Uh, yes, when you're focused, uh, that's like getting up in the mornings instead of having responsibility in a home or outside. Yeah. Uh, you go downstairs and work in the art area. So you're focusing, uh, you're thinking about art when you wake up in the mornings. You're thinking about creativity of any sort, really, in whichever direction you go. Yeah, I never really thought about that, that freedom from some of that responsibility means you're kind of freed up to pursue Absolutely. Absolutely. Joy, yeah. It's like that's the joy of retirement is I can do what I want. <laughs> uh, when you hit 80, I think, is when I begin to really realize that, hey, uh, I don't have any responsibilities. I really don't. No one depends on me for anything. Oh, I take that back. David depends on me. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. That's great. That's great. You know, there's also a lot of conversation when you think about the time that you have and the lack of, you know, pressing responsibilities, right? There's a lot of conversation about how much hobbies, creative pursuits, how they keep your mind sharp. Do you think that's true? Uh, absolutely. Uh, uh, also a sense of uh, just of uh, a positive attitudes, mostly as much as anything. It's good therapy. Yeah. I, I keep uh, hearing the, the word therapy, art as our creativity is, is therapy in any form, whether it's baking or art or anything like that, uh, music, anything like that is good therapy. Yeah, I agree. I'm a writer. So for me, I get so lost sometimes in writing. It's so nice to kind of, it is therapy. It kind of takes you away from stuff. It just kind of helps reboot your whole body, right? I love that. Yes. So the Great Crate program, um, I actually love if we could queue up a clip. We have a clip to share from the Great, Pro Great Crate program, and I'd love to share that with you guys right now. So let's take a quick look at this clip. You pull that up and let everyone see that. Great Create is a show that celebrates the influence of the creator. And each episode will dive into a different artistic venture. In this episode, we're getting our hands into sculpture. I started thinking about Carol's pieces related to the patterning that I like to use. It touches your humanity. I think that's what good art should do. Join Great Create as our artists work to inspire and win over our experienced mentors. And you won't want to miss the creativity that abounds. I love that. We're going to share more about how you can follow the program and stuff in a minute, but Let's turn to you, Terika and Stina. Let's talk about the opportunity to work on Great Crate and connect with an older person who kind of shared your passion for creativity. So, Terika, what did you think when you were first approached about Great Crate? I was excited. Um, first thought, I love a good challenge. So I was like, I am in. Um, but it, it was also, I was excited to have a learning opportunity. I feel like I've, I've never been mentored, you know, by um, a person who's had more experience than I, you know, so I thought I looked at it as this could be a, a great opportunity for me to learn something, um, as well as going up against another young baker had no idea how what kind of talent she had I had no idea what her, you know, creativity was. Um, and so not only did I learn from the mentor, I learned from her too. So I was I was super pumped about it. So it was competitive. It was competitive. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's so hard as creative people because it's like, it's all subjective, but it's competitive too. So that's fun. That's yeah, fun. Yeah. I, I mean, it wasn't like super like competitive. I mean, the show itself isn't based on, on, on the competitiveness, but I took it that way when I first, <laughs> when I first started like, I'm going to do this, but um, yeah, but at the end, at the end of the day, um, after it was all said and done, um, I was super glad I did it because I just learned so much from it. That's awesome. Competitive wise, Stina, given that you're, you were an elite athlete, I mean, I, you had to be like, yeah, right. And you actually worked with Mary on your episode. So what was it like? What'd you learn? Um, I learned, I learned a lot. First, it's really interesting that you said, like, I'm an athlete. So you would think when I hear a competition that I'm like, ready to dive in. But over the years, um, I've kind of adjusted my mindset to not, I, I don't want to say not compete, but it's more so with, with myself. So I went into this 
this whole thing, one, not knowing what to expect, two, I'm self-taught. So that automatically gives me a little bit of like, ooh, can I really do this? Like, am I good enough for this? Um, but I also went into it telling myself that I wasn't actually competing with another painter, but I wanted to challenge myself and do something I've never done before. And that's exactly what I've done. I did. Um, working with Mary Nell was really cool because one, just like Terika said, I have no mentors in this entire um, journey that I've been on. So it was my first, also my first like real conversation with someone who is seasoned in the art industry, who is a seasoned painter, who just well-rounded. And so I was nervous, excited, and also like got also a lot of reassurance after um, me and Mary's conversation during the competition. So I, I felt really good about it. But the my initial thought was like, ooh, self-taught here. I don't know if you guys got the right one. <laughs> but I'm really glad I did it too. I learned a lot and um, I would do it again. I would do it again for sure. That's fantastic. <laughs> Mary, now, what was it like to work with Stina? What was it like to offer her that advice to a younger artist? Well, I really didn't feel qualified. I, you, you just, it's just a funny feeling to sit and, because your work is part of you. Your work is part of you. So I just really, uh, it was hard. It was hard mm -hmm. because she does so well, as you said, to have painted such, such a short time. Uh, over, I had a growing time with me, with myself, you know, in the arts, because I've, uh, it was just different. It was different. Uh, but it was so good to see someone that just started to get to be so good so soon. So I knew she had a gift. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I, and that came, that word can't be overused sometimes. Yeah. I agree. And that's what I told her. I'm like, there's no way this is innate talent. Like you, you that's didn't right. know it was there, but it's unbelievable. Like that, that's a gift. Cause that's a pretty good. <laughs> yeah, she's very good. She's very good. And Mary Nell, in your episode, you also had a sculptor and a glass blower. So what was that like connecting with artists who work in like really different media? Uh, I don't feel qualified. I just don't, well, uh, you know, I don't see things in that dimension, I should say, as much as anything, uh, because mine has been a, a little different. Uh, yeah. I've, worked, I've worked with people that uh, started out in the oils and in the watercolors with me that have yeah. moved over to sculpturing, and they use the same theories on everything, and her, their minds are working in the same direction. Uh, but if you don't do it, if you don't step out there and try it uh, and get away from the one that you're comfortable with, uh, which is what I did, I did not step out there. I, I yeah. stayed with, with the ones that I was comfortable with, the mediums that I was comfortable with. So I think the creative process, too, regardless yeah. of medium. Absolutely. So Absolutely. I remember when I saw the Sistine Chapel, they talked about how Michelangelo was a sculptor who painted. And in the art world, it was like a big deal to talk about a sculptor who painted versus a painter who sculpted. And it was a pretty big thing to make a big leap to something so different, right? That's kind of cool. Yes. So Tara Constina, let's talk a little bit about what art brings to your life. How does creativity, we could start with you, Tara, how does creativity affect the other perhaps less creative or non-creative parts of your life? And you're on mute. <laughs> Technology. Well, I didn't say much, so we're good there. Um, I was saying, you know, I, I think all three of you have mentioned this already. Um, it, for me, it, it is therapy, right? It's a stress relief. Um, it, it when I, when I decorate in the evenings, usually because I have, I have a family and work and stuff. Um, it's just a way for me to just zone out and really focus, as Mary was saying, on being creative. Um, and so it, it's almost like a recharge for me. So for me to be able to do that, I can be recharged 
and do the other things in my life that I need to do. Um, and it, it makes me happy to do the other things in life because, you know, doing that at night, it makes me happy. You know, I feel so much pride and I'm and, and proud of what I put out there just because it makes other people happy. You know, I know that with painting, maybe you're painting for yourself. Maybe you do paint for other people for cake decorating. I do a lot for other people. And so to deliver something that they love and they, they smile about, it's just, it's really nice. It's, it's a good recharge for me. Yeah. There, there's something you're right. And I think Mary, now when you called it therapy, it's like you're, you have that pride of accomplishment, right. And that ability to express yourself just brings you that joy that carries over to everything else. Yeah. Yeah. Stina, how about you? How does all your creativity impact some of the other parts of your life? Um, so much like, like we've said before, my introduction to art was based on healing, um, healing physically, emotionally, and mentally. And so that was my relationship with art for a really long time. And it was not consistent because obviously as humans, our emotions are volatile. And so when I was at my lows, I realized I would turn to art or creativity to kind of help bring me back and ground me again. And then um, as I started to pursue painting and doing more shows and exhibitions, I, I was doing it for myself because my creations came of me. There's stories that things that I've been through, things that I needed to kind of work out and put on canvas. Um, however, as more people started viewing my work and connecting with those same stories, I realized that it was bigger than just me. And so, mm -hmm. although I still paint for myself, I know that there are a lot of other people who need those same stories. So it kind of trickles over into all the aspects of my life because then that makes you realize that you're kind of this walking, like, I don't want to say message or like, you're like aura of positivity that is, you're, you're just kind of putting it out there into the world, you know? And so all the, I honestly, I don't think that I have any non-creative aspects of my life because although I'm a mom I have to get real creative with a six-year-old you know and so there's it's creativity on different levels and I think it does trickle over because you, you start to know how to maneuver life a little differently how to become a little more positive how to decompress how to ground yourself and um so I think that's kind of how it affects me in my life or my non-creative you know areas in my life. I think it's interesting. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Mary. No. I'm sorry. Oh, I thought you were going to say something. No. no. Okay. I, I mean, I'm enjoying listening to the girls. Yeah. Well, and Steve, I, I, you know, the idea of being an accidental creative, I love that the only space they could stick you in was the art room. Yeah. And, I mean, like, there's, it's like, it's serendipity. It's like, we're right. going to be here. And so I think there are a lot of people who don't know they're creative, right? Mm -hmm. There is. There is. Yeah. And it, yes, especially older people that have come here uh, uh, don't realize that they are creative. That I think they just have been told that they need to stay busy and to create a, uh, their attitudes help a little bit too. So that's interesting people who've told been told they're not creative like if when you get to be retirement age if you've been told your whole life you're not creative mary Nell, how do people get past that and kind of like how, how do we help people get past that to say you know maybe i'll give it a shot they just have to make up their mind to step up to get on and step up to whatever's been offered to them here like uh here in this place Brookdale is just full of all sorts of busyness. You can stay busy doing so many things and you just have to have the courage to do that. Yeah. Yes. I think yeah. that's the benefit of age too. You're a lot more courageous because you've kind of had life experience that you don't, you don't care what everybody thinks anymore, right? It's like, I'm going to just try it. Yes. Yes. That's it's basically, that's, that's what you do. You I, just have somebody to... Uh, encourage you and uh, and praise you and compliment you and make you feel like you are doing something creative. Yeah. And I think having the time and, and like you said, you have less responsibility. You could focus more on yourself and things that you're right. going to enjoy. You know, that's great. Yes. 
So before we open up to any questions, I, I want to ask you oh, an important question too. We're coming toward the light at the end of the tunnel on this pandemic, right? We've had 15 months, 16 months of this, right? A lot of people, myself included, right, discovered new passions, new ideas, different things. You know, my big thing was I didn't want to come out the way I went in. I wanted to kind of have something to show for it. A lot of people discovered some new passions. Our social activities were limited, all that. Did any of you experiment more with anything, perhaps with your art or with anything else? And maybe, Mary Nell, maybe we start with you. Is there anything different you did during that time? Not really. I just stayed busy. Uh, had to limit the fact that we could leave the premises very easy. So I just set out to do landscapes and things around here. Mm -hmm. uh, that was one thing. No, I, I didn't really change anything. Mm -hmm. How about you, Terika? Um, I didn't. I didn't change anything. Um, cake orders definitely slowed down a little bit for me. Um, fortunately, for my day job, we actually got really busy, so I didn't quite have much time to do uh, much baking anyway. Um, so no, I didn't. I didn't do anything differently. I didn't test anything differently. Mm -hmm. Stina, how about you? Um, so it's really funny because before the pandemic, like I'm really introverted actually. I'm like an, I'm introverted, but when I'm in like art scene or at a show, then I'm, you know, talkative and can talk about my art for hours. But so at first I thought, man, pandemic, we're closing the house. This is perfect for me. I can just sit here and create. But reality quickly set in that like that meant no traveling no traveling to shows like I usually do um and so and then there was like a real big issue with uh USPS and all the shipping and stuff so I was like oh boy I have because I'm a full-time artist I have a six-year-old and so I'm like I have to make some some adjustments one what does that look like as an artist who usually travels to shows and so one of the things that I did focus on was my social media presence and connecting more with um, just connecting more with like artists who really needed a mentor during that time or really struggled with their creativity and things like that. So I did a lot more hands on connecting with with people, but I also ended up tapping into murals. And so believe it or not, like during the whole pandemic, everyone decided they wanted murals like either outdoor murals because it's spring and summertime is mural season um and I did a few indoors but that was like my eye opener it's like whoa I, n I didn't even think about going back to murals um and really showing my art on a larger scale so I was able to do some public art uh downtown Cleveland because that's where I am so we were in public square doing like um public art that really got the attention especially for everything that was going on during that time anyway it was just great to show your art on a grand scale and publicly and so then it just snowballed into more public murals um so I was really fortunate during during that time to get to go from working on canvas and oil to doing these large public murals and acrylic and um it's been a blast so now I'm pretty I'm pretty busy this summer just based off of the murals that I got to do during during that time so yeah it's been it was, it's been really good to experiment with that and kind of grow that portfolio along with my you know my canvas art that's awesome that's awesome did any of you find that your art helped you cope better we talked a little bit about creativity as therapy but did it help you with coping with some of the solitude and some of the restrictions of COVID? Absolutely. I actually, um, before I got into the mural thing, I actually created just to deal with like the high anxiety and like how I felt and emotionally and not, you know, my son not going to school and acting all crazy every day. It's like, I, I had a lot going on. And so I made a painting to, to help me process it. And it's literally called Pandemic. Um, and that was just my way of, it's a self-portrait. I'm in a mask. 
um, there's a guy in like a gas suit, you know, behind me. And you can see like Cleveland skyline kind of faded in the back and, and some scratched in wording that says like stay home and things like that. Uh, it helped me get through it. That was, that was really early on in the pandemic. And um, I could focus in on that, take the time that I wanted on that piece. And it really, it really helped kind of bring me back to the ground. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting because art sort of communicates to the future, like things that have happened. Like if you think about how we understand our world and history so often, it's through art that the artists left us to help us emotionally understand and process things that have happened in the past. So that's amazing. That piece of art, your your piece of art is going to let future generations kind of know. Yeah, that's super cool. Yeah. I, mean, I, I, think, I think for me, um, it wasn't necessarily about coping for myself. Um, what I had seen through the pandemic, the, through the pandemic um, and creating cakes for people was actually benefiting the customer. So, I mean, there were, you couldn't party, you know, you couldn't invite your family over, you couldn't book parties at, you know, bounce house or whatever. Um, so it really, uh, it was tough for people, right? It was tough for people to celebrate birthdays and celebrate with their families. Um, so they would still, I would see people still come to me and order, you know, small cakes for their family of four that are in their household. So it made, it allowed them to be happy still, you know, it gave them something to still be happy about during the pandemic. Yeah. So I thought that was cool. And, you know, it was easy for me. I could do porch pickup and it was great. They just pick up their cake and they still have something to celebrate. And, you know, with the Zooming and everything happening between, I even had a Zoom for my son's birthday with my family. So um, it was just, it was just knowing that I was still able to provide some type of happiness through all this whole thing. It, it's so interesting because your art is absolutely a vehicle for joy and happiness. I mean, that's just so cool. Yeah, I mean, you 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 make something for for somebody that they something in their life that they love. Whether you know, if it's a kid, it's like Mickey Mouse, or if it's an adult and they love beer, you know, I make a beer cake or whatever. So it's really cool to see them react to something that is tailored to them and what they actually like. So that's great, yeah. Marina. Any thoughts from you? Uh, well, one thing, and I'm looking at the little cookbook, is uh, David decided that we should fix a cookbook and put the pandemic on, on the front of it. So he needed for me to sketch out some, some things that is very elementary, uh, but fun. And so we made, uh, uh, yes. Uh, can you see it? Oh, um, yeah. Cute. Oh, so, my gosh. Look at the so nice, guys. But it was a fun thing. And when David said that to me, I thought, this is crazy. That is absolutely crazy. <laughs> so what I'm thinking is also something to remember. Yep, absolutely. About the arts. Yes. It's something That's awesome. So as bad as all this time has been, this will be a fun thing for us to remember. It sure will. Thank you for sharing that. So we have tons of questions piling up. Before we go to questions, I want to pop up. We have a slide so that those of you that want to follow Stina and Terika, we've got a slide. So here's Terika's. And again, you're, you could screen capture this, take a picture, but we're going to send you a copy of this so that you can see it yourself, right? So you can get this information later. But here's how to follow Terika in all our places. I so love the donut cake. It makes me crazy. Um, and then Stina on the next page, uh, you've got Stina's books and her art and all of this, some amazing stuff. Follow her uh, on there. So again, we're, we're going to send this to you afterwards so you can get this. Um, to learn more about Great Create, follow us on uh, brookdale.com slash great create series. You, you get, that's on our, on our website and also on Facebook. You can see that there. So definitely follow that as well. More to come. So now we're going to get into the questions. We have so many questions. This is awesome. There's so much, so much coming in. So it's time for you guys to ask your questions. If you haven't already put them in the Q and a, go ahead and put them in on Facebook, put them in the comment section and we'll get to them. So, okay. We're going to start at the top. Stina, why did you choose oil over all other media? All right, so <laughs> I'm about to tell on myself. 
<laughs> I was an athlete, obviously. I talked about that. And so, yes, in the beginning stages of, you know, the art and, you know, me doing art and stuff, I saw one of my former classmates painting and it was an oil painting. And the competitor in me was like, oh, I could do that. And so that's literally why I would, <laughs> there's no profound like answer to that other than I was being competitive and wanted to like do better than her painting. Um, so I went to Michael's and bought all this oil paint. And then I decided that if I was going to do this and do it for real, that I wanted to master one medium before I tried to master another. And so I just never really looked back from that. Um, in my defense, the only reason I was that way is because my teacher put that same, uh, that same girl's painting in front of me when I, was, <laughs> when I was very horrible at art. And he was like, there's always someone better. And it never left my mind. So yeah, that's, that's, <laughs> I, I told him myself, but that is how I got into oil paint. I love that when an athlete becomes an artist. I love that. That's awesome. Uh, next question, Terika, how did you teach yourself to make such intricate cakes? What resources did you use and what's worked the best? Um, you know, I have a, a, I'm big into social media, so I'm always on there. Um, so I honestly, I just, I looked at YouTube. I looked on Instagram. There are so many tutorials um, and so many influencer, influencers or really great um, cake decorators out there. I found a couple that I love their style and they had some great um, how-to videos. And that's just, I mean, that's just where I, I, I learned everything. Um, and really what's worked for me best in terms of getting better at what I do is just trial and error. I mean, you just keep doing it, <laughs> you know, like you keep trying, you get better, the more you practice at it. Um, but I am always, I mean, from inspiration to learning how to do something, I'm always looking at hashtags. I'm always looking at YouTube videos and different things like that. So. Yeah. And Insta is such a great, because it's visual, like that's where you go when you sure. want to be inspired or just chill for a while, you know? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mary, now you mentioned getting people to draw who didn't think that they could, how do you get them to have the confidence in themselves to do it? Oh, wow. That's a, that's a good question. Uh, the, their need for it. They uh, Usually people will ask you to do it for them to start with. And then you say, let me show you and, you and you can practice. I just went through this with the things that David's got us doing right now. And it's so simple. Uh, it just takes a little uh, pushing, a little bit of uh, encouraging like that, like uh, you can do it. You can do this. You can do this. And, and simple forms as if you were working with a, a bunch of third graders. Think, <laughs> seriously, think about it. That's great. Here's a question coming in from Facebook. And I, I love this question because it impacts so much of our lives, but maybe not when you're older, right? But for any of you, does imposter syndrome help or hinder your art? We all feel it. We all know it. How does it help or hinder you? Who wants to take that one, Stina? I will. <laughs> it, it's, you know, it's, it, that is an amazing question because I still ask myself, like, why do I feel this way? I've done like major collaborations with major brands and like, I, I, you know, I, I think that I'm doing well. I know that I feel like I could be better. Um, I will say that sometimes it can hinder you and create some anxiety when you're going into into like a bigger piece or something that you're not used to doing. However, I will also say that imposter syndrome has made me almost like try and level up so that I feel like more and more that I deserve to be in the space, that I deserve to take up space and I deserve to be here. So it makes me kind of focus in more and continue to critique my work and say, how can I be better? How can I be better? How can I be better? And then each painting, try to add those things 
to the painting. So for the past six years, I've painted every day just so that I can teach myself the things that I know that I'm maybe behind on or, or don't know. So imposter syndrome can hinder you, especially when you're doing commissions and you have to send the work and you don't hear from them for a minute and you're like, is everything <laughs> okay? <laughs> um, but in the long run, I definitely don't think that I would have had exponential growth in this industry if I didn't feel that way. Yeah. Tarek, anything to add to that or any thoughts of your own on that? Um, I mean, I definitely felt incapable when I was asked to do great create. I'm like, I'm sure I don't know if I could do this. Um, but you know, I, I think I think it's just kind of human nature sometimes, you think, especially when you haven't been doing it for a long time, right? When you haven't been doing your creativity for a long time, you kind of question yourself, like, am I good enough for this? But I always have to remind myself, I look back at pictures and they get so much praise and people love them. And you look like I take pictures of everything I do. And I look at that and I'm saying, I did that, you know, like there, it, it looks great. And that's talent there. Like what I'm doing and creating this masterpiece, like that's talent. That's, ta you can't just, you can't just whip that up if you're not talented. So I just have to remind myself every single day. It's just like, you, you do a good job. Like people yeah. demand this from you. So, you know, just know that you can, know that you got it. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I mean, just constant reminder every day. Marino, anything to add to that? Uh, I really don't have much to, to add to it. it uh, by the time you hit my age, you begin to say, oh, can I see well enough? <laughs> <laughs> That, oh gosh, that house is beautiful. That I, I I can do this. I can paint this house, and I can. But can my vision? You do. You begin to. You begin to doubt what as you get older. If it's especially if it's a commission, <laughs> and they want three windows, they don't want just two windows. They want three windows. So. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm joking about all this, but it's real. You yeah. Know, yeah. Yeah. You know, we have a question and Mary, Mary Nell, I'm going to ask this of you. We have a question from somebody that says, and, and anyone can answer this, but Mary, now you may have a good perspective on being at Brookdale. Any insight into encouraging creativity with a senior who has limited mobility and who during COVID lockdown has kind of stopped speaking and they're trying to find ways to engage her. Any thoughts or insight from any of you on that? We could start with Mary now. Well, I just experienced one uh, with the, uh, the craft that we're doing right now. And I realized because I didn't know at what capacity she could see, but she wasn't seeing well at all. And finally she said like a straw, seeing things through a straw. And these were big wooden uh, structures that we're painting right now. And I didn't know how to start with her, but I just walked around with her. Uh, it's very difficult, it is, it's very difficult. So you do more listening than you do anything because you watch them to see what they're leaning toward or what they seem interested in uh, on a small, minute to minute, area to area. In other words, I was watching her hands to see what she was feeling. Uh, is, this, is this a wrong conversation? Am I, am I talking about the right thing for you? So it's just, it's hard to do. It's very hard to do, but you still, you, you're not backing off now. Uh, she'll be back. She'll be back to see us and just watch us if nothing else. Yeah. Uh, uh, it, it is. It's a strange feeling. It's a strange feeling. That's great, though. That's great guidance. Um, we have another question. There's a couple of them. For the working moms, <laughs> how do you find time to do that? And and with, you know, with family and all of that stuff. To Mary Nell's point, when you have fewer responsibilities, it's easier. easier. How are you guys finding time to do all that? Yeah. <laughs> It's, it's, it's hard. It's difficult. Um, I mean, I, ha I have a full-time job. Um, I've got two young kids. Um, 
So most of my time, I have to do it when nothing else is going on, which means late nights <laughs> for me, um, sometimes early mornings. Um, but I do it because mentally I need it, you know, like mentally I need it. Um, but I'm, I am a queen at multitasking. So I think that is helpful. Um, but yeah, it's just late at night, early mornings. That's when I have the time to do it. So my, I didn't really start painting until after my son was born. So mm -hmm. I really only know how to function with him and it's just me and him. So that's been kind of cool when he was really young. I would just literally sit him in my lap, give him a paintbrush, and he would just paint with me. There was nothing he could put on that canvas that either didn't make sense because he is me and my art is me, so <laughs> it just works, um, or that I couldn't fix. So he would literally sit in my lap if I needed to get something done and paint with me. Um, but yes, the early mornings came into play. Um, and as he got older, I mean, he's only six, but he has a really good understanding that this is what I do. And, and he's proud of that. And so he he's actually very helpful when it comes to, you know, if he goes to my shows and stuff, he knows exactly like this is mommy's art. Um, so we have a really good balance. And now that he's school age, um, a lot of my work can get done while he's at school. And then I dedicate my evenings to him. But still those 4 a.m. still call me. <laughs> I've been doing 4 a.m. since for six years now so it's so funny that you that you mentioned uh, having him in your lap because now that my son is he's four um, and sometimes I do have to cut into my day hours or weekend hours and the kids are up uh, but he does want to help often so sometimes I will ask him to help me with things I will uh, that's a good way to maybe get some things done um, for other people out there is try including and if you have kids, try including them in what you're doing and giving them something. I'll be making something with fondant and he goes, can I play with, can I make, can I roll that out? I'm like, yes, buddy, here's, hey. here's a pile. You can roll it out for me. I need this cut out and this cut out. I really don't, but you know, I'm like, so I try to include him and I keep him yeah. busy too. So. And, it, and it just gives them an appreciation for one, what their moms do. You know, they have an understanding, like as they grow up, they're like, man, my mom's pretty cool. She let us, <laughs> we do, you know, but also just of the arts and like of creativity and it gives them, mm -hmm. you know, an eye opener too of like, well, she's doing it. So maybe I could too. And I said this um, during our last meeting is an artist, they said, there's a quote that says the artist is just a child who survived. And so I focus on that with my kid a lot. Um, to try and plus he doesn't think I'm working anyway so that's even better it's even better mm -hmm. for him so he doesn't think that I had to choose work over yeah. being mom but that he could be included and in creating really cool stuff with mom you know that's really cool yeah. and just exposing them to creativity is, is right. so good at a young age uh, we have another question Marina you are so joyous this is somebody saying, you're so joyous, so joyful. What is the last thing you painted? Oh, uh, the last thing I'm working on is uh, East Texas woods uh, with deer. Uh, it's a landscape. And after I did the painting, uh, we have uh, some craft things that we're going to gather. I also work with a group with the ceramics and mm. as well as... Uh, oh yeah, and so I have taken that landscape and put it on a metal glass that uh, my friend then makes it into with a polyurethane over it uh, into glass. So that with the, this is a fun thing. Yeah. And uh, yes, uh, so I'm doing something that I've never fooled with ceramics before, but here. Uh, I found that it was fun just to take some acrylics and paint on them. I don't know how to do all the ceramic details before or after, uh, but it's been fun. But I do love landscapes. That's great. And are you self-taught as well? Someone's asking. No, I, I painted on my own at times when I could not get with groups, you know, for a model or something. But uh, no, no, I have taken uh, college courses, in fact. 
I took college courses here in Dallas uh, and in Mount Pleasant. Uh, I learned the watercolors after we retired to East Texas. So uh, I grew up in East Texas and that's where we retired from. Well, that's great. But uh, that, I, I'm always working on something. I can make a still life out of absolutely anything. You saw my cookbook cover. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I love that. I can make a still life out of anything. That sounds like a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> But That's yes. awesome. Stina, there's a question for you. How did you pivot to a different medium when you went from oil to acrylic? And was that challenging for you? I absolutely hated it. Oh, it, really? I did. I did not like it. Um, but I was, I had no choice. Um, so I experimented with things. Like at first I was, I was in a situation where I'm like, well, I'm here now. I got to finish this painting some way, somehow. So figure it out. Um, but as I realized that I was getting commissioned more and more for murals, I was like, no, I really need to figure this out. And so I started experimenting with like, you know, at first, dr uh, slow dry mediums to add to the acrylic that can kind of help me with the adjustment and things like that. Um, and different types of acrylic paint. And I finally found one that just... I absolutely love. So I kind of stuck with that, but it took a lot of trial and error. It was not talk about imposter syndrome. Then I'm like, <laughs> here we go. <laughs> I, I don't think I can do this, but yeah, it took a lot of, it was very challenging. Um, and then to make the adjustment from oil paint where I feel, I'm pretty sure you can do it with acrylic. I just don't know how, but I feel with my oil paint, it gives me very smooth, um, and I can, I can get real, more realistic with it. Whereas my acrylics, I had to make that mental adjustment that my acrylic murals won't look like my oil paintings and that that's okay because it's not supposed to. Um, so that was a big, big adjustment too for me, but a lot of experimenting with different things to try and figure out um, what I like. And even still going from like my studio all day where I'm painting oil and then going to a location where I'm finishing up a mural that takes me a little bit of adjustment as well. So it's all like, it's all challenging, but I guess it, you know, as I continue to, you know, do it more, I can make the switch faster. Cause sometimes I'm just staring at it like, all right, what do I got to do now? But yeah, it, it's definitely difficult. That's great. Terika. Do you have a favorite cake or piece that you've created that you just love that you're like, that's the one that you're like, this is the best thing I've ever done. You're on mute. <laughs> By the way, that's, we all need those t-shirts from the, from the whole pandemic. You're I know. I was told to mute and then I just keep forgetting to do it. Um, it's funny. Cause I, I'm just actually scrolling through my albums of like all my cakes and I just, it's so hard to pick. Um, I, now I can tell you which cakes I haven't liked <laughs> easier than I can tell you what I have. Um, but I, oh gosh, I don't know. I, I do, I don't do very many, um, I don't do very many like wedding cakes. I do more like birthdays and things like that. Um, but all the wedding cakes that I've done, I've absolutely loved. I love the simplicity of it. Um, the, the beauty of wedding cakes um so i mean those are my favorite type of cake to do i would say um but i it's too hard to pick a favorite <laughs> mary now um somebody is asking if your art is available anywhere where they could see some of your art uh not right now uh i've uh i don't have uh my work in any areas uh before i moved here uh to Brookdale, uh, I was in some places, uh, but you uh, could just get in touch with me if you want any information here at Brookdale. Uh, Brookdale even uh, makes prints for me because I make prints of my work and cards. So uh, that's great. Yes, just get in touch with me through Brookdale now. That's great. And thank you. That's a kind thing to ask. Um, there's another question asking how you guys went about making your art into a business. I think that's, it's interesting. Uh, I know you want to start that one. Are you asking me? 
I'm asking all, it's addressed to all of you guys. Oh, okay. Uh, I started uh, because of the little shop, uh, one of the little flower shops locally after I had retired, uh, asked me uh, about my cards. And so uh, it just, just grew from there. Uh, and then I started putting them in the museum because I was doing structures of, of landmarks in the little towns here. And uh, it just happened. Accidentally. Yeah. It was really accidentally for me. I mean, I, I, I was just, I was just looking to post a video of me completely failing on this baby shower cake I had to do, but it just, it took off. I mean, people were like, "Hey, do you take orders?" I'm like, "I can." Yes. Sure. sure why not? So very accidental for me. Thankful. Very thankful though. Yeah. I mean. We kind of ended up the same. Um, I mean, I, like I said, I wasn't painting very early on. So what I was doing was like pastel drawings and sculptures and things like that. And I'll never forget when someone was like, well, how much is this? And I was like, what do you mean? <laughs> I'm like, this is worth something. I was really confused. I'm like, I didn't even know how to price it. So um, after that, it required me to to kind of reevaluate one, if I even wanted to make it a business, was I doing like, is that what I wanted to do? But then, uh, you know, after that, I was like, well, I think everyone deserves to have art and everyone deserves to feel good. And people wanted like their, their animals who passed away and things like that. And um, <laughs> I was like, well, I want to make people feel good. And I want them to have like, you know, art that they're connected to emotionally in their home. And so the adjustment for me was, was a little bit rocky. <laughs> um, I did a lot of things wrong to figure out like the operations and, and pricing and things like that. That's actually what my book is about um, that was mentioned in the little where to find me stuff. Uh, it's called Entrepreneur, Making Your Dream a Business because I did a lot wrong. <laughs> I did a lot wrong. And so the transition, um, Transition wasn't easy, but once you figure it out, I mean, once you do it right, it's fulfilling, you know? Yeah. Like <laughs> art. Like art. Once you get it right. Yep. I don't know if that if, if that person is asking for advice on how to do it. I think, Stina, you you would be great on giving the advice since you wrote a whole book about it. I was just going to say, go get the book. Yeah. I, I mean, think I you wrote the book on how to do it. Yeah, I was gonna say, just share your stuff with the world. I mean, there's so many, you know, for me, it was just sharing it. Like, right, exactly. You know, yeah. let people but You gotta it. share it. And I always ask like the artists that kind of ask me questions. I'm like, well, do people know that you're you're selling your work? Do they know that it's for sale? <laughs> That's number one. <laughs> sometimes people don't even know. Some, sometimes people just see what you're doing and it's a passion. and and you've never even shared with them that you want to sell your stuff. You've never shared yeah. your platform that you're trying to make it a career. Mm -hmm. um, so that's number one is show your work. That's literally the first chapter in my book, I think. And okay, so everybody who's interested in that has to get your book because you wrote the book, literally wrote the book on it, which is awesome. And speaking of showing your work, um, Mary Nell, some of your art is on the Brookdale Facebook page. So folks that want to go see some stuff, I just got a little note in the side window that says some of Mary Nell's art is on the Brookdale Facebook page. So you could check it out there. Mm -hmm. And we, I could talk to you guys for like hours and I know we're coming up on time. Um, so I, I want to thank you guys. This has been such an awesome, awesome webinar this is probably one of my favorite ones ever and i so appreciate you guys being here um and thank you all to all of you who are in our audience watching and asking questions again you're going to get a recording and a transcript of this webinar you could come back look at it later look up everybody's handles to see their stuff find mary Nell's stuff on the brookdale facebook and so thank you all for being here and we host these webinars every month so please please join us for our next webinar on Wednesday, July 20th, 28th, 3 p.m. Central Time. The subject will be CBD for seniors. What does the research say? Now, 
We know there's so much chatter about what CBD is and how it can work out in the world today. So join us for this webinar. We're gonna to talk to Jeffrey Chen, a leading doctor, a leading MD, studying CBD to find out what the latest research says about its capabilities, its side effects and more. You can register at brookdale.com slash in the know. And our webinars feature a different subject every month. So you can go to brookdale.com slash in the know to watch past webinars, watch this one again and learn more. So we do hope we see you again soon. And thank you all. This has been such a wonderful, wonderful journey today. Appreciate it. And until next time, we hope you all stay safe, happy, and well. Thank you so much. Okay.